Hi, Julio. What's happening, world? Facebook, hey, Instagram. What? Hi, world. <laughs> My name is Lance, and I have a dear friend, uh, Haley, here to have a conversation this afternoon. We're going to be talking about some vulnerable stuff, some hard things uh, that Haley has experienced personally, and we're thankful for her vulnerability and just being here. But Haley, shout out to you. Thanks for joining me. Do you want to give a little plug or intro of who you are, what you're doing right now? Well, right now, I'm not wearing any pants. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently without a job as a musical artist, and I'm thriving. I have a new dog, and I have food in my fridge. You know what I mean? That's great. Okay. I'm just Count grateful. your blessings. I'm just grateful. That's the, uh, that's the summary of me right now. All right. Well, we were having a conversation over the phone. I think I think it was an ongoing conversation for like a couple of weeks because I started sharing with you just some of the struggles that I was going through. Um, some of the fear that's happening right now is just personally for me as a follower of Jesus with all this uncertainty that's been going on. But then it was also kind of like added on as a church leader, experiencing really the unknown of what church is going to look like. And still we're in that spot as a church. And we were just talking about pain. We were talking about um, this internal realization um, of struggle as we walk with Jesus. Um, and I would attribute it to this. We're going to we're just, just, just dive off the deep end real quick, okay? So this experience has been historically called the dark night of the soul. When you realize maybe your disintegration or the, the spaces where you're lacking or failing in regards to your following Jesus and how he invites you to step into the gospel as you realize those things. So the, the, that's, that's my really brief and bad description of the dark night of the soul. But this comes from St. John of Chrysostom, and I probably pronounced that wrong, but he says it this way. God is purging the soul. And listen to this language. Annihilating it, emptying it, or consuming it, even as fire consumes the moldiness and rust of metal all the affections and imperfect habits which it has contracted its whole life. They're deeply rooted in the substance of the soul. At the same time, it is God who's passively working here in the soul. And so I think we could have recognized maybe a week or two ago of you experiencing what we might call a dark night of the soul or like hitting a wall or just experiencing struggle um, where you are in the moment. And these words are just so honest and vulnerable, and I want to claim them for us in this conversation. Like, there are things in your soul that God is annihilating <laughs> or emptying or consuming. <laughs> um, but if you, were, if you were just to begin to describe, like, what was your struggle? What, where did this depression or sadness come from? How would you give us a window into your experience of this dark night? Yeah, um, so I think that, that, that I've been going through something like this um, for well over a year, almost a year and a half. Um, I don't know if some of that is some coming of age, like I was leaving my 20s, entering into my 30s, Yeah. and feeling that page turn. I know that you have felt that too. We're we just both celebrated dead. birthdays. We're over it, right, though? We're in 31s. 31s. I know. We're, like, officially in our 30s. Yeah. Um, so some of that, I think, is just a coming of age where, like, your 20s are just, they tend to be pretty self-centered. And oh, yeah. you're making a lot of big first moves. And I don't know. I, I think some of, some of what I'm experiencing is just a natural ebb and flow of aging. And then... Um, another big thing that I see changing is I had grown up in a really, in a really like peak and popular time for Christian music and yeah. the relationship between Christian music and the, the mega church or the popular evangelical Western way of doing church. It was like a crescendo for those two things in the industry. And so I I think being exposed to that and really being in the thick of it, um, I, was, I was working with a lot of presuppositions in ways that I thought that my life was supposed to look and the ways that my life was supposed to kind of climax. Um, and so my definitions of success and what doing that well 
would look like were very specific. And so fantasy and the way that I had idealized my life turning out um, just had some really specific parameters around it. And as I started to realize that I didn't actually want those things, which is the deeper thing, right? Like not just that it wasn't shaking out the way that I thought it was, but that I actually didn't want it. Yeah. And that I was I was engaging something, a way of being, a way of life that I actually no longer wanted. It's like an actual deeper grief than just the feeling of it being taken away. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I've been kind of working through the different layers of this for some time. And I think COVID and this weird quarantine time has actually been um, such a grace to me because it, the world quite literally stopped moving Yeah. and it gave me permission to like just deal with these things on the surface where there was nothing else thwarting or fighting for my attention or there was not even any old distractions that I could reach for that would make me feel safe and familiar. Like none of that is an option. The whole ecosystem and my whole framework of what success and failure looks like historically, I can't even engage it because it's not even there anymore. Yeah. And so I suppose that the internet is still there and numbers are still there. And, um, there are metrics in play to show like if someone is, doing well or not doing well in terms of popularity but I don't know like maybe maybe God just in his grace like had allowed me to already create a little bit of space between me and that medium um it kind of made room to do some of this deeper work so that's how I kind of categorize and summarize the dark night like at least the the poignant topics that are in play in this part of the dark night of the soul. I mean, I think it's pretty multifaceted, but that's a big one for me is, is uh, the death of a success failure metric system that I've been living under um, for a really long time and self-inflicting for a long time. Yeah. So you are definitely in a unique position as an artist. I don't think many people who are listening um, I mean, I think some people are artists in, in the same positions as you are, but um, for the main thing that we that we kind of identified happening within your word I hear right now is um, the space of success or metrics um, had really become to define who you were and how, I mean, it sounded like you uh, placed a lot of your identity as a human in the ways that you felt like you were succeeding. Um, and so like as you as your theology or perspective of just church in general shifted, um, those old metrics of success, which you had placed a little bit of your identity in, were kind of being taken away. And so you were kind of left with figuring out, well, who am I now in this process? Right. <laughs> of like <laughs> mm-hmm. now that this success and failure is gone, what do I really do? Um, so in this in this process, how do you think you're able to recognize this shift within you happening um, as you begin to feel some of these emotions? Can you ask that last part one more time about the shift? Yeah. How do you think you're able to recognize this m- movement happening within you? Like, was there a, a specific conversation or were you praying and it was revealed to you? Or were you reading a passage of scripture? Like, what was the moment when you realized something's going on inside me? Yeah. Well, I definitely don't think it was a moment. I think that it's been moments and mm-hmm. um, they sort of have a way of compounding to affirm I am truth. I am truth. It's almost like, uh, and maybe that's just God's way of working with me, but, um, it's almost like he can't just say it to me one time. It's got to be affirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed as it is almost making its way down my digestive system spiritually and, um, internalized. And, and I would say if I were to describe a theme with all those moments, um, Initially, it just felt like every little thing 
that was propping me up and my sense of like, my life has meaning today. My life has meaning today was just dying and it was just falling over and nothing could almost hold the weight of me anymore. And um, so that was initially what all those moments were showing. But then I think the way that I started to experience hope again, that resurrection was coming or that new life was coming was I began to experience like joy break in in really unexpected ways or the enjoyment of things, which is sort of the the um, opposite of, I don't know if it's the, the exact opposite of depression, um, despair, but enjoyment is definitely on the opposite side of that spectrum. And so I just started to see enjoyment pop back mm -hmm. up and surface. And and it was really striking because I just I I really mm -hmm. didn't realize how how long it had been since I had enjoyed something. Those things, small things, and all these things were very small. These were small moments. Um, walking outside and something catching my attention or really loving make, making my coffee that day or just being enamored with this bagel that I just toasted and decorated and then ate. Like I've seen one it of those. was really it's pretty small. <laughs> yeah, it was like really small things um, where joy just felt like it was breaking in. I didn't even feel like I could, I, I wanna be careful how I word this, but I don't even feel as though I was choosing joy. It felt like joy was breaking into my house. It was like finding a way in a back door, a window, an air duct. And it was just surprising me over and over again. And so, yeah, if I were to describe what that shift felt like, it was kind of like that. Right on. Okay. Yeah. I, I think, uh, oh man, it's so good to hear that like there was a, a forceful intrusion or like disruption of joy happening within you, even though there was probably moments when you really either didn't want to or couldn't choose joy because of what you were feeling. But if you were just to like, if we we're just to be honest and, and confess, uh, uh, what types of things were you feeling like in these moments of night? Um, I want to uh, post up, we had uh, Susan uh, I don't know if she's still here, but ask the question, how do I deal with fear during these dark times? And I think probably one of the, the beginning pieces is just confessing like what is inside of you. Yeah. Um, so if you were to like uh, spitball or describe like what are those types of feelings and emotions that you had um, during this time? How would you describe it? Um, it felt like it felt like paralysis. It felt like fighting the sun from rising again and yeah. and then and failing at that every day and then being depressed that I failed at it every day and feeling like completely out of control and angry that I'm mm. not in control and I can't I can't end my own suffering and there was moments that felt like really frantic where I was like looking for anything nearby me that could somehow satiate my pain or numb it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then those things sure enough failed me. And then that just made me more angry and irritable. Um, and it was almost like slowly the walls were closing in yeah. every time that I failed at ending my own suffering. And I mean, the ultimate fear was that the walls would get so, so close and so tight that it wouldn't be feeling like I was paralyzed. It would actually be me not being able to move anymore. Yeah. And, and honestly, a part of me wanted that. Like, I think a part of the nature of self-sabotage and just the nature of death, like something dying, like a grain of wheat falling to the ground and dying. I think, I think there is a moment of burial yeah. that I was just fighting tooth and nail. Like I just, I don't think we want it 
I don't think people want it. And, um, yeah. And then honestly, uh, just to be transparent a little further, um, once I was done like resisting the walls completely closing in and completely being buried, I started long to be buried more than I long to be alive. And, um, the metaphor that I used with my close friends at the time was every day I'd go out into my backyard and I would dig a grave and I'd put my body in there and I would bury myself and, and I would lay there just, just wanting to die more than I wanted to live. And, and then sure enough, the next day would come and Christ in his goodness and in his promise would raise me. Mm-hmm. And his mercy would be new. And I would like spring up out of the ground and be like, what the heck? I got to do this all over again? And I would actually be mad. I I would actually be mad with the Lord for the way that he would keep waking me up every morning. And I would be confronted with his mercy. And I would be like reengaging the wrestle all over again. Yeah. And And it felt like the most miserable Groundhog Day. And there's a lot about COVID that just feels that way, period, and being in quarantine that feels that way. But I had been sort of living this and experiencing it for, like, over a year. And so even far before this quarantine, I just – I was living in that cycle, and I didn't know how to make it end. The morning just kept coming. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I know some of those things are – kind of new for you as you've been processing through this. Um, And I I think what's really interesting is there are, there are moments of the dark night or there's moments of this feeling of suffering um, that feels so hopeless. Uh, But the truth, especially as we find in scripture, um, these moments are deeply meaningful and impactful um, that God has not necessarily, I wouldn't speak for God himself and say every dark moment comes from him because I think there are definitely situations whether someone has sinned against us or we've sinned against someone that has spiraled us out of control Um, but there but I think there is a beauty in knowing and understanding that these moments of of pain and deep grief uh, regardless of what they are I know your struggle was with this um, changing perspective of like identity and success and failure, but also for other people who are experiencing these dark nights, they're so meaningful. And like God can use these moments to begin to shape us and mold us as like the the refining fire or the, the potter and his clay, those images from scripture to make us more and more in the image of Jesus. Um, and so I'm so thankful for your experience and you describing that because I, I know that as you continue to process and go through this even more, God is just shaping you to become someone who he's always designed or desired for you to be um, through this dark night. There's a, I'll share another quote. <laughs> There's this Russian, uh, this old Russian Christian philosopher named Nikolai Bet- Berdyev. I probably said that wrong again too, but he says it this way and kind of like just drawing out why the night is meaningful or these moments of grief or fear are really meaningful. He says it like this. Night is not less wonderful than the day. It is not less divine. It is lit by the splendor of the stars and it reveals things to us that day does not know. Night is closer than day to the mystery of all beginning. And I think it's so poignant or so refreshing for us to realize that those moments of night and struggle reveal deep things within our own soul, that moments of comfortability, moments of joy, moments of happiness, moments in the light, if we're to extend the metaphor, could never expose or rid us of as we follow Jesus even further. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think uh, in most cases, we might even use a description of like the wall, of like hitting a wall. Uh, in our emotional or spiritual formation. And I have like, I don't want to like ruin our moments with a dumb graphic, but I hope this is like helpful for people. (laughs) Um, Because I think what you've described is kind of this movement around this graph. And it's not necessarily linear. I think you can find yourself at different moments. 
but you had this awareness of who you were in God. You moved to a space of learning or discipleship as you were growing and playing at different churches and ministering to people through music. Um, and it, it turned into like this active life of you. This was what your life was surrounded by. This is what you did. And then you just hit a wall. Um, and I believe this was probably from the Lord of making you realize some of those pieces that you had given away in your identity instead of trusting who God was. Um, and what I, I what I found is most people um, uh, have a really hard time with going through the wall. Um, I think you described of like you just wanted to give up. You didn't want to continue. Um, and I think if we don't have the capacity or we don't have the energy, we don't have the trust to go through the wall. A lot of times we're just stuck in a, a phase of tension or depression. Um, we question who God is, or maybe we leave altogether because we're like, God doesn't have anything for me. Um, but after we go through the wall, there's moments of introspection where we realize those things that we have to grieve and give away. Um, or let die, as you even said in your own language. There's moments of integration um, where you then begin to put your perspective, theology, and your experience together as like this holistic form of following Jesus. And it's like you're taking those steps forward. It's like becoming more like Jesus and then um, maybe to end the stages of, of turning into someone of love, being transformed into a person of love. Um, where you're humble. And I love how Scazzaro puts it in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. A shout out to Carrie, who uh, just commented she recognized the graphic because that's where I got it from. (laughs) Um, But when we make it through, we no longer have a need to be well known or successful, but all we want to do is just just to do God's will. I just step into his grace and to be a part of or, or participate in what he's doing and his plan of renewal through um, San Diego for your community, for your street, for your home, wherever it is. Um, And some of us hide or run or flee from that pain, but we have to begin to step in and trust that God's desire is to transform us. Um, And it's God's desire to um, take your old self and to renew you day by day, to bring new mercies and to make you more in the image of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, So if there was, if you were to take a moment and reflect and talk to someone who might be experiencing something like this, like you did, um, who's walking in this dark night, who might be struck with fear, who might be struck with depression or anxiety, or it might have come on by this COVID moment in quarantine, whether people have lost their job. But what would you say to someone who is beginning to recognize that they're stepping into this experience? <clears throat> I would say the first thing I would say is what I think we all need to hear initially. And that's that there's a pardon for you in Christ to just struggle. And Mm -hmm. there's a permission for you in Christ under heaven, this appointed time to just kick and scream and throw every punch that you can at God, um, with yourself. And on some level, your relationships are going to feel that it's very natural. Um, and that has to happen. Yeah. And there's no amount of like self-help, self-prescription, spiritual prescription, (laughs) outside formula that will save you from that. It won't. Nothing will. You're meant to kick and scream Mm. and to throw punches. You're meant to wrestle through this moment. Um, And my my encouragement to you is to receive permission to do that because in receiving permission to do that, you're inevitably going to be receiving forgiveness for sin. Absolutely. And, and Confession and the and the beauty of confession is just wrapped up in everything I just said. You are met with forgiveness mm. when you confess, and that's why it's beautiful. That's why yeah. it's beautiful when we practice this in the body of Christ with each other in friendships like Lance and I began a few weeks ago, um, but especially with the Lord. And that's really what you're needing, and that's really the only thing that raises you is Christ crucified for your sin <laughs> yeah. and Christ raised to give you a hope. 
So the hope that's died in you and that needs to be cleansed and renewed comes from this. Yeah. And it only comes from this. Um, there are going to be other places that you look for, and that's okay. God has a way of retaining your focus and reeling you back in. Like, I have come to believe that if I see someone running, or if I look in the mirror and I see that I'm running, I can still have full confidence that there's no place I can run or my friend can run or my sister or can run that Christ won't find them. Yeah. And so, man, if that's still in you to do, my friend Jasmine says this to me all the time. She's like, if, if you still have fight in you, go. If you still have <laughs> like a desire to run, go. Yeah. Because Christ will come out all the more beautiful. The gospel of Jesus will be made all the more clear in your life. There is an experience of the gospel that's not just coming, but it's already at work in your running. And I, I have just found so much confidence and renewed sense of hope in that because it, it, it really does allow you and I to be wherever we are today. Yeah. It really does. And it really does cause us to tilt our chins up and look up to the only one that can really change our hearts and really rewrite these beliefs and reform them, reshape them. It really does put us in a posture to look completely and solely on a savior yeah. for the change that needs to be brought about in our lives. And um, I do believe that as this process happens and we fix our eyes on Jesus in this way and we become so de desperately dependent on him in this way, obedience and the will to do um, comes. Yeah. But I, I'm, I, I've become a firm believer just going through my own stuff and looking at the life of the church around me that it is God who works within us both to do and to will. It yeah. truly is God. The amount of self-resolve and motivation and discipline that I curate within myself for change and transformation has a limit. Yeah, and, absolutely. And when I entrust those things, um, when I empty my hands of that, and I look to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and I look to the power of the Holy Spirit, well, what does that mean? It just means becoming poor and needy and dependent. And <laughs> <laughs> that's actually what it means in real time. When, when that begins to happen and our hands are emptied, I've, I, I'm seeing now in my own life, and I really believe that I'm seeing in the people around me the power of the Holy Spirit at work. And that's the gospel work that we long for. That is the meaningful life that we're craving. That is, that is the life of purpose and calling that we're all desperately looking for, but we misplace. We misplace in temporal things and, and we allocate to fantasies of grandeur and arrivalism in this life. And God is in his own way in each of our lives he's freeing us from that and there's no measures that he's not afraid to take like he will do it and he will have his way in his kids and that's actually been my greatest hope and comfort and so um i would encourage people with that 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 this is who jesus is um this is the love of the father and this is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in just a bunch of broken, wildin' people, you know? <laughs> Amen. Oh, man. There's so many good things in there. I'm thankful for your voice in that. And I hear just the Spirit using your experience to draw out and describe truly what He desires in all of us, that we would realize our brokenness and our powerlessness and actually trust and lean on Him completely. Uh, I think the uh, young kids would say that was lit. I think th that's what they would say normally. <laughs> <laughs> that was lit. Wow. That was so good. Haley. Good old people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
but that's so true and i love it and this this darkness fear experiencing pain and struggle we have to begin with confessing those real and raw emotions and i love how you identified it 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 pieces of it are alone pieces of it are in the closet at home by yourself but there are a lot of pieces of it that are are confessed to um committed friends and community members or partners with you I mean, you can't do it alone. You have to be willing to step out and be vulnerable. And as you do that, God meets you and transforms you. And he takes that vulnerability and it just uses it within the group to draw out even more help and commitment with one another as a, as a, as a community. And so I, I would love um, for anyone who's experiencing this, if you, if you need prayer, if you need support, I can speak for Haley. You can DM us, you can text or call. We would love to spend some time with you just in conversation, describing and teasing out um, these emotions and how you're feeling. But yes, uh, last question, um, and then I'll yeah. let you go. Uh, what is life giving for you now? Like what, what is beautiful again that you really struggled to see beauty in before? Where is there, where is there hope for you now? Uh, yeah. Um, honestly, There's so many ways to answer that question, which is like, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. Yeah. Um, honestly, music has become that again. And I, that almost makes me want to cry because even just like two months ago, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even touch an instrument or sing like it's it's so crazy how how quickly God has begun to make that new again in my life um just really recent like within the last couple of weeks and I think serving other people has become life-giving again and not a threat mm. and by that I mean when we're around any amount of fear or scarcity mentality with our creating and with our being, um, which I definitely have been in different ways, serving people in some ways can feel like a threat. Yeah. Like almost as if, if we serve people, we will deplete our bank of what we have to give and we'll no longer have enough for ourselves. And God is just doing a deep work in my heart with that. And, and serving people in the last few weeks has been one of my like utmost joys. And some of that has been musically, but some of that has been like helping the homeless guy push his cart up our hill because it's really steep and he's 70, you know, like it's actually my favorite part of the day. Um, yeah, so those are just a few examples. I, I, yeah, it's good. I've been baking for my housemates and serving them in that way. And I'm a terrible, you know, <laughs> baker and homemaker in so many ways. And so just unexpected that I would ever find joy in any of that. And with the circumstances that are in play, like I just, I keep getting surprised like I was overjoyed to go to Home Depot yesterday to get paint samples for my walls. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Just genuinely so much joy talking to the old Hispanic guy at the paint counter about paint. Like it was, yeah. So those are just a few examples, of just very ordinary, very mundane things. But um, th that's how you know it's God. There's yeah. nothing extraordinary about it. It like is not even on the poster board of success and failure the way I used to think, like of like meaningful or not meaningful. It's it's been really beautiful. That's awesome. Well, Haley, uh, your gift, your story and experience is such a blessing to hear about. And I hope uh, other people are as, as blessed as I was just having a conversation with you around these things. And um, I know we hope or uh, we believe and trust that God is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving to liberate people from their nights, 
um, from their dark night, from this grief and from this angst. And um, so I pray for you, uh, just continual trust and mercies, the continual gift of joy in those small mundane things. And I want to pray for anyone out there. We'll be praying for anyone who listens that they would continue to experience and step into this dark night and that God would um, help them climb over or through or do something with that wall to experiencing that joy as well. Um, but thank you again for so much. Thank you for everyone who's listening. We got a, a shout out to Julio who agrees Yay! and allow what you were saying. Thanks, Julio, for hanging Lucky in there. Um, I think Martin was there too. He's got a long one. I can't read it right now, but we'll go back. <laughs> Thanks for joining and listening. Uh, Haley uh, has got some great music out there. She had released an album called Confessions a while ago, which is still a beautiful work. And a lot of what I think we dealt with today is on there as well. So go listen to some of her music. It's You can find it at our website. But um, shout out to you, Haley. Thanks again for joining us and uh, for Thanks. everyone else out there. We'll see you later.